Okay, I'll get started. I thank you all for being here. Uh, I didn't expect a big crowd. Uh, I have given this talk to a crowd as small as one, owner of a company, and I've given similar talks to crowds as large as 2,000, and this is somewhere in between. But if you're here, you must have an interest in hiring and retaining and having good drivers, and I appreciate you for being here. Uh, I'm a crusty old trucker. I grew up in trucking. I worked in many different trucking companies uh, and started Avatar and Avatar Fleet about 25 years ago. Uh, our focus is principally on people and how we can address performance issues in an organization by focusing in on the people. So while you see the shiny trucks down there and the CNG and the beautiful tires uh, and the great transmissions, not our thing. We can't be very much help there. But if you have problems with people, we might be able to help. And that's why I'm here today to talk a little bit about people. Um, with that, I really want to talk about two things today. The first uh, portion of my presentation is talking about what we call the driver problem. Anybody have a driver problem here at all? No? You don't have a driver problem. No, Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we like to refer to it simply as the driver problem. We want everyone to start to consider it the driver problem rather than a host of uh, or different series of problems. But the problem is this. Uh, today it is difficult to find, attract, hire, inspire, and retain quality drivers. There are a host of reasons why and we believe that it's the nemesis for the industry. We believe it's the one thing holding many organizations back and when we can bring a partial solution to that problem through this moment of illumination uh, we're proud to help you in any way we can. So we'll talk a little bit about the driver problem and why it exists and perhaps have you look at it just a little bit differently than you do today. And then I'm going to bring up five specific strategies that you can use to improve the performance of your people and partially and never completely but partially solve the driver problem. We had a wonderful party last night and the vice president of the ATA was at our business, uh, Neil. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about what my vision is for the future. I says, we're going to solve the driver problem in America. And he started cracking at me. He goes, you better go have another martini. <laughs> he goes, this just isn't going to happen. I says, well, we're not going to solve the problem, but I promise you we are going to make a little bit of a dent. So let's talk a little about the driver problem. It's an age-old problem. In 1987 or 1988, I wrote a paper called The Driver Shortage in America. It was about a 135-page white paper citing all sorts of demographics and statistics. Uh, it was when I was working for a little company called Progressive Insurance here in town. We were writing a lot of truck business at the time. Ironically, that problem persists today, and it's not a whole lot different than it was in 1987, with a few notable exceptions. Today, we have the CSA. Today, we have demographics working against us. Today, we have drivers who aren't retiring. They're dying. They're unfortunately dying in their 60s. They don't even make it to their 70s if they even stay with us that long. Young people are not joining this industry today. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles to it. It's not Google or Apple. It doesn't have a website to it. And they say, why do I want to be a truck driver? So we're challenged by the demographics. And we're also, as you know, challenged by the CSA and some of the other hassles that are brought upon by regulatory compliance and regulatory issues that people just throw up their arms and say, screw it, I'm going to go build houses or work in a factory or do something else than this, this is too much suffering and pain. So the age-old problem is there, the demographics are getting worse. Meanwhile, many of you are turning down loads. How many of you here have one or more empty tractors against the fence right now? And every single day that goes by, you look at that tractor when you pull in and you get a knot in your stomach and you say, there's another load I could haul, right? Because there's no shortage of freight. The phone's still ringing. People are still calling going, I got a load for you, and you don't have a driver to fill that tractor and send them down the road. And that's an ongoing problem for almost every one of our clients and almost everyone I know in this industry today. I'm going to steal just for a moment. I was with a trucking company, one of our clients. He has about 500 drivers. And he was doing a presentation to all of his drivers. And he said last year, and he was being very trans transparent with them, he said last year, we brought in about $81 million. He goes, last year we spent about $81.5 million. 
<laughs> he goes, we, we bring a lot of money into this business, but we have a hard time making it stick. And I said, do you mind if I steal that idea? Because I think that's the same thing as the case with drivers. We bring a lot of drivers in, but a lot of drivers go out the back door. We're having a hard time getting them to stick. And so I call that Teflon trucking here. <laughs> you know, we bring them in, they last three or four months, and then they leave. However, I would also argue that a lot of you probably have drivers who have been with you five, 10, 15 years, right? They're just, they're, they're, they're reliable, they're safe, they're good with the customers. You, they show up on Monday morning after payday on Friday, they're there for you. Meanwhile, this is other cadre of people we keep churning through. And so when we think about the driver problem, we first have to figure out why does a driver come to work for you in the first place? And why does a driver ever choose to leave you and go somewhere else? And with that notion, I'd like to just drag you into Psych 101 for about six minutes here and talk a little bit about human behavior. We spend a lot of energy, and I spend a lot of my personal time, trying to understand why people do the crazy things they do. And largely because we focus in on safety, why do people ever get up in the morning, go to work, and get killed, break their arm, fall off a ladder, run into an intersection through a red light, we study human behavior trying to sort out what makes people tick, what makes them do these crazy things that harm themselves. Why would these people hang from ropes on a picnic table over a cliff, 550 feet up in the Swiss Alps, and of course drink at the same time? I'm guessing you have to drink first just to do this, but why would they do this? What makes people tick? We're going to go backwards in time about 115 years to Skinnerism. We're going to talk basically about what's called behaviorism. It suggests that for every behavior or action you take, including coming here today, there was an antecedent that prompted it, and there was an expected reward that you thought you'd get. So the antecedent might have been, there was a notice out there that we're going to talk about driver retention. Oh, I got a problem with that. Maybe I'll go to this. The behavior was coming to this talk, and the reward perception was that you were going to get something out of this, so my hope is to give you something today. Real simply put, I'm thirsty. I see a drinking fountain. So my antecedent is thirst, my behavior is get a drink, my reward is I've quenched my thirst, right? It's very simple. Now, if we all do things to get rewards, what we really are thinking in the back of our minds and silently asking ourselves every time we're confronted with an antecedent is what's in it for me? When you look at an ad, what's in it for me? Do I want this kind of razor blade? When you look at a person that you're attracted to, what's in it for me? Will she be nice to me? Will he be a good man? We look at any kind of a situational demand and we ask ourselves the question, what's in it for me? We use this question so often trying to sort out behavior, we simply refer to it as WIFM. Have you ever heard the term WIFM? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of WIFM. Great, I got a psychologist in the back of the room. Excellent. So what does WIFM have to do with your drivers? Your drivers are always asking themselves the question, what's in it for me? The drivers who don't know you, the drivers who don't work for you, the drivers who do work for you, the drivers who left you last week, they're all asking themselves, what's in it for me? Why do I want to be here at Unger Boone Trucking? Why do I want to stay? What's in it for me? Your drivers join you on day one when you run an ad, you do your recruitment, you bring them in somehow, some way to your business, they join you for a few major things. Quality of work life, whatever that means to them and whatever you've told them. Good pay, and I would argue to you, good pay is not how many cents per mile, but more likely how efficient you are as a business. Your customers, your lanes, your ability to turn that driver after he's unloaded and get a new load and get back out on the road because he's only making money when he's rolling wheels. And so your efficiency has a huge impact on his pay. Attention and respect, something that every single one of us wants and desires and needs just as a part of our life. And finally, a voice at the table. They join you on day one for those things. And on day one, I will guarantee you that the positives outweigh the negatives or they would not have joined you. They took in all the information you gave them from the ad, from the interview, from meetings, from testimonials from your drivers, and they made a balanced judgment and they said, joining this company is a good thing for me. It answers the what's in it for me. There's more rewards here 
than there are punishments. There's more rewards than there are downside. I'm going to join this company. So they join you for that quality of work, good pay, attention and respect, and a voice at the table. Why would they ever quit? On day one, you gave it to them, didn't you? On day one, you promised it to them. They're getting what they wanted. They said, what's in it for me? This guy's got all the stuff I want. I'm going to join up. And then at some point, a month, two months, three months down the road, they say, take this job and shove it. I don't want it anymore. I'm going somewhere else. That's because the negatives, once they got into the reality of the job, started to outweigh those positives from day one. That teeter-totter balance went out of balance, and they leave you. Drivers join you for quality of work life, pay, attention and respect, and a voice at the table. They leave you for those same reasons. They didn't get enough of those things that they expected, and so now they have wanderlust. They're going to go down the street and look again. Oh, maybe these people have pay, competency, attention, and a voice at the table. They left you for the same reasons they came to you, and they're coming to you having left somebody else for the same reasons again. And we just have this crazy churn going on all across the industry. So there was a study done of which we contributed about 2,000 data sets. 25 or 26,000 drivers, principally in a long haul and regional over the road van driving mostly, but there were some specialty haulers in there, were interviewed in exits and asked why they left. And these were their quotes in order. I don't make enough money. I'm not satisfied with my home time, and that could be too much, too little, or not at the right time. I don't like my supervisor. And there's a whole body of research, by the way, that says people don't quit companies, they, they quit a boss, they quit the person they're working for. I'm not happy with the way I'm dispatched, and often that had to do with efficiencies. The job is not what I expected. There are no opportunities to improve my situation. That doesn't necessarily mean getting promoted into some role, just improve my situation, getting better loads, better lanes, better freight, whatever. There's, uh, the company doesn't communicate with me, and then I'm not appreciated. So I highlighted each of those key words, money, home time, supervisor, dispatcher, expectations, opportunities, communication, and appreciation. And we would say these are probably, <clears throat> probably the reasons why those drivers leave. How many people would agree that that list, while maybe not complete, is a large part of why a driver would say he left? You've heard those things, haven't you? People have said those things. Drivers have said, I'm not making enough money, or I don't like Bob, he's a jerk, or I don't like the way you dispatch me, I got stuck in New York City over the weekend. These are the words that they say. This is the citations that they say are the reasons. And so one might be tempted to say, well, let's just go solve this. If the guy's leaving me because he's not getting enough money, let me just give him some more money. Is that a solution? It's not a solution because we don't have any more money, folks. There's no more money to give them. And guess what? It's not a solution anyway because I would argue these aren't reasons why people leave. These are symptoms. And whenever you go about problem solving, if you go seek to fix a symptom, you're probably still stuck with that same root problem. And all you've done is fixed a symptom. You've given them more money and people keep churning. And you're saying, why? I gave them more money. No, it's because you didn't fix the root problem. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the root problem and how you can fix these symptoms in a way that actually gets you to keep your people. There are actually five strategies, and I'm going to call them retention strategies. And when you first look at them, you're going to say, well, what does that have to do with retention? I'm going to begin at the very beginning on the far left side of the page and say it begins with recruiting. We're going to talk a little bit about what recruiting means and how to do it efficiently and effectively. Then I would love to talk to you for about a week or two on selection and hiring, but you won't listen to me. And so I won't talk about selection and hiring more than a few slides, but I do believe that as an industry, and for that matter, all of us business owners often hire our own mistakes. We hire our own sack of woe and our own problems. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk a little about orientation and the opportunity to align these people with your business and to show them the love, what we call the big wet kiss. A little bit about education and training, and I'm going to challenge you when I get to that slide and ask you if you've ever said those words, and I'll, you'll see what I mean when I get there. And then a little bit about what I call the retention reinvention, uh, new strategies and new ways that we can hang on to our drivers. So let me begin with recruiting. In the industry, in trucking, most people think of recruiting as getting drivers, putting them through the process of the paperwork, having them pee in the cup, and handing them the keys and getting them out on the road. I would like to carve out recruiting and say recruiting 
is the activity associated with finding and attracting them to your front door in the first place. It's not all that other stuff. It's not selection. It's not orientation. It's not credentialing. It's come on down. We've got a $495 Pontiac for you. We got a great job for you. And some companies do a better job than others. And many people spend gajillions and gajillions of dollars on recruiting. And if you open up any one of the magazines at a truck stop or get online, you'll see that almost everyone's ad reads the same way. They all make the same promises. We all make the same promises. And the driver who wants to leave the company he's with, who wants that quality work life, better pay, a voice at the table, and a little bit of attention, looks at all those ads and says, well, I like red trucks better than blue trucks, or I like Pete's better than I like Freightliners. And that's about the best chance he's got of making a decision about where he's going to go next because everything else is the same. Imagine going to a diner and you get the menu and everything on the menu is cheeseburger and fries. You get six choices, cheeseburger and fries. What are you going to get? I'll bet you're going to get cheeseburger and fries if you're going to eat there at all. The truck driver is facing a menu that is identical. Every single item on that menu is identical. How is that person supposed to make a decision about why he or she should come to work for you? So recruiting is all about bringing them in, attracting them. You don't want everyone. And I would argue today that when you run your ad, you probably get 50, 60, if you're real lucky, 100 applicants. How many people here process 50 or 60 applicants a week? Anybody? I have clients that are doing 100 a week. Do you know how many good drivers they get out of 100? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Because I look at the stats every day. Five, somebody said five? Anybody say more? My highest one is 6.2 per 100. My most stringent employer is currently getting 2.5 per 100. That's a lot of applicants. That's a lot of minions, folks. You don't want everybody on your front door, and you don't want to process reams and reams and reams of applications. You only want to get those drivers attracted to your company who are a good fit for your business, who are going to be happy in your business, who will like the work that you have to offer, the trucks that you have, the loads that you have, the lanes that you run, the way that you dispatch, the way that you treat, the way you pay, and the way you give them benefits. You want people who are like what? Your senior people. People who are a good fit. And I ask you, what is a good fit? You may or may not know what a good fit is. You may have a gut sense, but I would strongly encourage you to ask these people. Sit down with four or five of your senior most drivers. Hey, Tony, what do you like about this joint anyway? You know, I've never really asked you this question, but I'd sure like to know now. You've been here for 15 years and you're one of my best drivers. Why have you stayed with us all these years? I've got all these other young pups coming and going churning through this place, and yet you've been here with me. And I want to thank you for that, by the way. Thanks for being here. I'm really grateful, because you're a great driver. Now, why the hell are you here? And sit down and actually have the conversation with them. You get two things from this. One, you find out why he's there, which is a really, really good thing to put into your next ad, by the way. More importantly, he now has a voice at the table. He's telling you. You've asked him. He's telling you why he likes to work there. He's feeling empowered. He's feeling loved. He's feeling like, wow, they've taken the time to ask me this question. I'm going to give them the answer. And some will give you the answer, by the way. And some will gripe a little bit along the way and tell you the reasons what they don't, they're not so happy about, right? But they will talk and they will tell you. I say sit down and survey them, conduct interviews on a quarterly basis, and maybe even have focus groups. Whatever you learn from them, Try to synthesize it into three, no more than three, because people remember odd numbers better and three is a good number. I like threes. Get it to three key reasons why your drivers stay with you and write your recruitment ad based on those three. But before you place that ad on Bubba Junk or put it out into a Randy Riley publication or stick it in the local rag, show it to your drivers. Ask your drivers, is this true? Is this accurate? Is this really why you stay here? Because you want to attract drivers who are like your senior drivers. So your ad should read with words that resonate with your senior people. People who will like the same things, people who will value the same things as your senior guys. We say that your inside reality needs to match their outside perception. What do I mean by that? There is some reason why you're a good company. There's some reason why somebody has stayed with you for many years. I don't know what it is. 
And you may have a gut feel, but you should ask the question because once you do and you find out what your inside reality is, that's what you want to portray on the outside. Today, what's portrayed on the outside is respect, home often, new trucks, great maintenance, best pay in the industry, and a whole host of other platitudes that everybody else says. Even if they're lying, they're saying the same things. And when they say those same things, all it does is lead to just noise. And the applicant can't sort out all that noise and find out why you're best. Find out why you're best and build your ads and your recruitment efforts around that. Make sure it's true and have something good to say and make sure your senior people look at it first. I guarantee you, if you can attract drivers based upon this little formula alone, you have a better chance of hanging on to them longer because you're going to be attracting people who like what you are all about and who value what your senior guys are all about. Once you do attract them, the next art and act and science is what? Selection and hiring, right? I'm going to challenge you. Scott, who's in here somewhere probably, was driving through the Carolinas, right? On a back road, going to visit some of our customers. And fortunately, this was not a customer of ours. But he did come across his sign and decided it was worth stopping his car, pulling out his cell phone and taking a picture. If this is both your recruitment and your selection process, you've got a problem. We did not stage this. This is real. <laughs> this is on the side of the road somewhere in the Carolinas. And somebody's using this as their mechanism for recruitment and hiring. Kind of scary, huh? All right, so don't do that. Today, you bring in those 100 applicants that I spoke of before, of which several may very well be qualified. What does qualified mean? Well, they've got a CDLA, they can pass the, the drug test, there are not too many uh, points on their MVR, their CSA is not too dirty. All right, so you know, we say they're qualified. They can pass a DOT physical 391, 41, whatever. Is that the criteria by which we hire somebody? Do we make the decision based solely on the minimum requirements? If I showed you these three drivers right now, how many people would pick the driver in the middle? <laughs> he looks kind of angry, doesn't he? How about the guy on the right? Is he kind of looking happy there? No, nope. usually this is kind of a dummy test, but usually I show these three qualified drivers to everybody, and everybody says, oh, y'all take the guy on the left. Well, that's the guy that just ran the intersection and killed three people. You can't tell a quality that leads to safe, good customer service, good, reliable, conscientious, emotionally stable behavior based upon the minimum qualifications. You need to dig deeper than that. You need to find the character of this person. And I would argue you want to find somebody who's like your senior drivers. Why? Because if they like the same things, if they value the same things, I can just about guarantee they'll be reliable, safe, and good with your customers. Why do I say that? Because your senior drivers wouldn't be your senior drivers if they weren't doing those things. And so if you find applicants who are like your senior drivers, who value the same things, who answer the questions the same way your senior drivers do, you're much more likely to find more people who will stick and you won't be Teflon trucking any longer. Once you bring them on, the inevitable happens. We have orientation. Imagine you're a truck driver. You have now worked for nine different companies in the past 12 years because they all have. And every time they come to another trucking company, what do they do? Oh, we're going to go through orientation. I was with a wonderful, wonderful lady in Alabama. She's a safety director. And I asked her, do you have an orientation process? I sure do. I said, well, tell me all about it. They sit right there in that chair that you're sitting in, and I read them this book. <laughs> I go, wow, that sounds fun. How long does that take? About three hours. <laughs> she goes, but before I do that, I make them pee in the cup right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's so oh good. I bet they're really feeling the love. So how many people here have an orientation process? You all do, right? Of course you do. You have to have an orientation process. We need to tell them the rules. We need to tell them the routes. We need to tell them where they're going to get paid and where to turn in the paperwork, right? How many people here have an orientation process that lasts a whole day? Everybody? Yeah? How about two days? How about two weeks? Two weeks? All right. How about two months? How about two years? How about always? How about never ending? Orientation should not be a sheep dip. It should not make this person sit down and listen to you read the book for three hours and make them sign page one so you can stick it in his file and hold him accountable later. Imagine you're at an outing, a party, a bar. You're socializing with other people and a person of the opposite sex, presuming that you like people from the opposite sex, comes up. 
and says, how would you like to dance? And the other person pulls out the rule book and says, well, okay, I th I'd like to have a drink with you, maybe even go out on a date, but first read this rule book and sign this on page one here so I can hold you accountable. <laughs> Won't that be a great relationship? You're going to run like it's fatal attraction. And yet that's what we do when we first embrace a new employee often. We give them the rule book and make them sign and say, we're going to beat you with a stick if you break these rules. This is the time for giving them a big hug, a big wet kiss. If you join a church, a club, a family outing, the first thing everybody does is embrace you. They love you. They're glad you're there. They thank you for being there. They say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've missed you. I haven't seen you in so long. Or you're aligned on various values and you think the same way and you like the same things. That's this opportunity. Orientation should be that opportunity to align them with who you are, to say we really care about this customer or that load or these lanes or safety or customer service or whatever it is that's really important to you. We want to make sure our trucks look the best. I got one company, they're just so happy that every single truck in their fleet is different. It's a different color, it has different markings, it has different logos. Every single color, every single truck is different. And they even have a, a tagline that says, a truck of a different color. That's their tagline. Everybody gets their own custom truck with surfers and horses and spray paint, you know, really sexy trucks. But that's their thing and that's what they care about and that's what they preach to their people when they embrace them. Orientation is a process. It's a time to thank them, to show your appreciation, to reward their decision. Remember, they just left another company to come to work for you. They're all wrapped up thinking, ah, I wonder if I made a good decision. Is this a good place to work? This is your opportunity to thank them for that. It's also the perfect opportunity to explain your expectations. How often are expectations out of sync? What the guy thinks he's signing up for and what he just did sign up for. This is the chance to do that. To be clear, I'm going to get you home every other Friday. You're going to be home for a 34-hour restart or whatever it's going to be. Delineate the expectations and have the guts to ask the question, what are your expectations from us? What do you, why did you join us? And what do you think you're going to get from us? And how can we make sure that you get what you signed up for? People don't want to ask that question because they're afraid the guy's actually going to tell them. And they're even more afraid what the answer might be but it's worth having the conversation. It's no different than a relationship with a man or a woman or a friend. Have the conversation, ask the tough questions, say, what will you expect from us? Okay, now that I know what the expectations are and you know what mine are, we're on the same page. So you're getting yourselves on the same page. As I said before, it's not an event, it's a process. You can't afford to put a person through weeks of orientation, but you can afford to have a mentor answering his questions on a regular basis. A senior driver who cares enough to contribute to the good of your business. And one of the toughest things I've asked some of my clients to do is to pick up the phone during those first few weeks and call the guy. How you doing? How are they treating you? Is it exactly what you thought? Oh, it's a little bit different? How so? Is there anything we can do to make it a little bit better? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Have the conversation and ask the tough questions. The very fact that the person is able to articulate the answer and give you a little gripe or two, you don't have to solve every problem. It's called work for a reason. But the very fact that you asked the question and allowed him at least to vent a little bit allows him to feel like he's got a voice at the table, one of the reasons they leave. Next is education and training. This is teaching people all the things that they need to know, which we call knowledge, it sticks in the brain and all the skills that they need, which is how to do things like shift and steer and use your signals and get out and look before you back the vehicle. How many people here have some kind of formalized education and training associated with newly hired drivers? A few of you. How about for existing drivers after six months or a year? Anybody? A couple safety meetings, right? Okay. Education and training is giving them what they need in order to do their jobs well. And you don't lose all of your drivers because they become unhappy with you. Sometimes you lose your drivers for other reasons. How many people here have ever had to say, gee, he was a really good driver, I hated to let him go? Anybody ever had to do that? Hmm? No? You've never had to do that? We hear this all the time. People say, oh, yeah, he's a great driver, but he screwed up, he got in trouble with the DOT, or he, he falsified his logs, or he had an accident, or he didn't do a pre-trip, and the wheels fell off and killed somebody. There's always something that comes up that they say, he was a good driver, but. If he was a good driver, but, and he went out and made a mistake for lack of knowledge or skill, that's on you. 
If he went out and made a mistake because he said, screw it, I don't like these rules, I'm going to break the rules, that's a different story and, and there's a different solution for that, by the way. Education and training doesn't work. But if they make those mistakes for lack of knowledge or skill, that's on you and that's your opportunity to improve your retention through better education and training. But as long as I'm on the subject of education and training, I can tell you where to start. Start with your dispatchers. Whether you call them fleet managers or dispatchers, people quit their boss, they don't quit their company. Make sure that you have some kind of a formalized development process for these folks. Often they're really good drivers that got put into dispatch. They understand the system, they understand the freight, they understand the customers and where to go, they understand the DOT regs and rules and logs. They don't necessarily have people skills. Be sure they get some developmental, I don't care if it's Dale Carnegie classes, make sure they get some communication, conflict resolution, delegation, and time management skills. All too often that pay problem that we talked about at the beginning is the result of dispatchers not being efficient at their job, not turning the drivers quickly enough after they get that load or calling up and saying, hey, my guy's there, he's been there, he's been there for two hours, we either got to charge you, we got to get that guy out of there, I got to turn my driver. It's that skill set that the dispatchers have, they make more decisions in an hour than the owner makes in a week, simply because there's more of them and there's more decisions to make. And all those little decisions add up to be the straw on the camel's back that breaks the camel's back that causes the driver to leave. Last but not least, let's talk a little bit about why we came for today. Retention reinvention. We, re we recruited people who like us. We were careful in our selection and didn't hire people who were dunderheads. We gave them a big wet kiss through orientation and we put them through some level of education and training. Now let's hang on to them. What we need to do is constantly be aware of the positives and the negatives by driver by day. How many positives are on this guy's teeter-totter and how many negatives are on his teeter-totter today? And what can I do to make sure that there's more green blocks than red blocks every day? Every day should be like that first day. Remember when I said he joined you? because the positives outweighed the negatives? I guarantee you he joined you because the positives outweighed the negatives. He wouldn't have joined you otherwise. So he joined you for those positives. Now all you have to do is make sure that every single day there's that many positives. The same is true when we're dating or we get married and we find a wonderful, wonderful, lovely lady and we say, will you be with me forever? And then we wake up one day and we have this. And you go, yikes, now what do I do? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist that picture, sorry. <laughs> All right, you want to make sure that the honeymoon is never over. She may get ugly over time. He, he may snore a lot and drink too much, but if there's a good relationship, you can keep that honeymoon alive, you can keep that love alive, and you do that by treating them appropriately. Talk with them every day. Listen to them. Ask them questions. How are you doing? How are things going? Mix it up with them. Conduct regular surveys, formalized surveys. They can only be 10 questions. I don't care. It could be 15 or 20 questions. They're simple questions. Do you like the lanes? Are you making enough money? Go back to those eight reasons that they told you that they left and just ask those questions. Ask the blunt questions. You're afraid of the answer. Don't be afraid of the answer. Giving them the opportunity to give you the answer is half the battle won, even if you don't like what they have to say. Give them the opportunity to have a voice at the table. I say never miss an opportunity to have an uncomfortable question. And I would say that this is true in marriage counseling as well. Hey, honey, how am I doing? Where would you like to go tonight? That was a really nice meal. How can I help clean up? Asking the tough question is how you build a strong relationship. So you ask questions like, are you having a good day? Are you happy working here? That's, that's worthy of asking once a month. How can I make your life better? And then we have the stop, start, and keep doing. What can I stop doing that would make it better for you? What can I start doing? Oh, answer the phone, not put you on hold for 15 minutes, not lie to you, not leave you stranded. Oh, okay, I'll work on that. What should I keep doing? Giving you this run on Tuesdays? Oh, okay, I'll keep doing that. Ask the question, just letting them vent and answer the question is half the battle and keeps them there longer. Another key element is in your dispatch, if at all possible, please try and make sure there's a one-to-one -one assignment of drivers to a dispatcher. No one wants two, three, or four bosses. And I tell you, I spent 25 years in trucking, and every single week my employees had a different boss. They either had me or they had somebody else because we were on seven-on-seven-off shifts working a big brake bulk. 
And literally, we would come in on day one, and the guy would go, okay, here comes Gardner's crew again. And they would know that there's a whole new set of rules and a whole new set of norms and a whole new set of way of doing things from that other crew that was there for the last seven days. It's even worse if you have a dispatcher that's different every 15 minutes or every time you call in. Try and get them assigned one-to-one. -one. Number two, sit in dispatch. If you own a business, if you're a president or a safety person or even a recruiter, sit in dispatch for an hour a week. It is out, it's just unbelievable what you'll hear. It's just unbelievable. I have sat in dispatch for companies that have eight and 9,000 over the road drivers and watched people put people on hold and then chatted up with the dispatcher about, wonder how long he's gonna last? Wonder how long he's gonna last here? And they have 250% turnover, I wonder why. The guy's stranded on Squeedunk, Idaho and the dispatcher's putting him on hold bragging about how long it's gonna take and betting how many seconds it's gonna take before the guy hangs up and gives up. That's ridiculous. We got our hand fighting our foot at that point. Sit in dispatch and listen to the way the drivers, the dispatchers are talking to the drivers and the way they're answering their questions and whether or not those are, they're asking those tough questions. Make sure your dispatchers do have those skills. Either hire them because they had them already through great leadership development or make sure they go through some formalized process. And finally, tie a chunk of their compensation to turnover. That will get their attention, even if it's only five or 10%. Make sure that they know that that's a metric that you're going to look at by person. What was your turn turnover last month or last quarter? I'm going to tie a piece of your compensation to that. Guess what? Once their compensation is tied to that, they'll start to think of their own clever ways to hang on to those drivers. So going back, I said that these were symptoms. I don't make enough money, home time's not right, I don't like my supervisor, I don't like the way I'm dispatched, unfulfilled expectations, not enough opportunity to better myself, bad communication, and low appreciation. Then I shared with you five strategies, recruitment, selection, orientation, education, and retention, reinvention. And you're saying, wait a second, those things don't line up, do they? How do those solutions manage those symptoms? Without getting into the devil of the detail, I will tell you that we have aligned each of these solutions with each of those problems. And you'll find that all of these problems over here begin to evaporate when you do a better job of the five biggies, recruit, select, hire, orient, educate and train, and treat them right, lead them properly, communicate and listen to them. There are three kinds of drivers that you better care about. You better about care about drivers who don't work for you. There's about a million of them out there right now. I know you care about them. If you're a recruiter, you really care about them. You want them all to come work for you and apply for you right now, right? But you better also care about the drivers who work for you. Right now, today. We've been at this now 45 minutes and somebody's just left your company. I don't know who, I don't know what his name is, but he's been wooed away by somebody else while you're sitting here trying to figure out how to keep him. He's going somewhere else. And you ought to look at those drivers who used to work for you because they're a known entity. They may not have been perfect, but don't dismiss them all as, oh, he was a dirtbag, I don't want him back. No, he wasn't a dirtbag on day one, and he wasn't a dirtbag on day week one or month one. Why did he leave? How can we get him back? These people are all your prospects. Every single one of them is a prospect. But we treat the guy who doesn't work for us a whole lot better than we treat the fellow who does. We should be treating him like a prospect as well. And that's how I say retention is a lot like recruitment. We say all these wonderful things to a person we don't know. Why don't we say those same things to someone that we do? We should never quit recruiting, never. It's an ongoing process to make sure that they know that they're loved, that you're listening to them, and that you have a good job for them and you wanna treat them right because otherwise someone is out there saying those false words, those platitudes to woo them away and to get them to come to work for them. And when that driver leaves you and he goes there, he's going to find it's not a whole lot different because it's trucking, guys. It's a tough job. It's a tough business. And I'm not here to tell you that anything I've told you here today is easy. It ain't. It's heavy lifting. It's difficult work. But I have seen companies take their turnover from 300 to 80 percent. I've seen companies take their turnover from 80 percent to 15 percent. It can be done, but you've really got to be vigilant across the board on all those people processes. It's a tough challenge. It isn't going to get any better. This is just going to get a whole lot worse as those demographics can, people my age, we're all dying. I mean, we're out of here. We're checking out. And I tell you what, the young aren't joining in as quickly as you would like them to. We have to hang on to those quality folks. Okay.
I thank you. I would love to answer your questions if I, if I may. Uh, I have also brought several white papers up here that are a very deep dive into the psychometrics that drive some of this conversation right here. Some of the studies that we've done and participated in, uh, they're well worth your read. I, I strongly suggest you, you grab one and take a look at them because there's a lot of information in there that's valuable to you. Well, thank you all for sitting in the back of the room and making me talk loud. I appreciate that. And thank you for coming. And I hope you can find some grain haulers out there by uh, Sandusky to uh, haul your products for you, my friend. All right?